Good morning and welcome to Five Before the Bell, the Street.com's daily market update and U.S. market preview right here from the heart of the Financial District in central London and the studios of Core TV. I'm Martin Bakardax, London Bureau Chief here at the Street.com. I'm going to take you through those five things you need to know before the bell today. We're back from an investor conference that we held yesterday here in the city of London on Monday. And we're back in the game with some interesting moves in financial markets. We'll get right to it and look what's happening in Europe because we are mixed at the moment as global investors pull back from those all-time highs that we saw yesterday and 10-year highs that we're seeing in Asia ahead of the Fed's two-day rate-setting meeting in Washington. Interesting overnight in that we saw the Nikkei 225 in Japan rise 2%. Over the 20,000 barrier today was the standout performer of all global markets. They were off yesterday owing to one of the national holidays. So they came back and played catch up. The yen was a little bit weaker, and therefore we saw the Nikkei 225 rise. Another reason for that rise, though, and it's worth mentioning, is that there could be a snap election announced later this week, which would take place next month, if Prime Minister Shinzo Abe follows on from speculation that we're seeing in the media. That could ignite some speculation of maybe even easier fiscal policy, and that could lift stocks even further. That's definitely one to watch. Didn't necessarily filter through here into Europe, however. We are mixed, as I say, largely off the back of some profit-taking and the moves that we're seeing in currencies, both on the continent and here in the United Kingdom. We're looking at a pound, which is just under that 136 mark, but it has eased a little bit, and that gave a boost to the FTSE 100. The euro, however, is bumping its head against that 120 mark against the U.S. dollar, and that's held down gains across the continent, even though we had some decent numbers from an investor sentiment survey out of Germany today that does suggest Europe's largest economy is on pace to continue its growth momentum. But really, you can't do much of anything on a day like today because investor focus is now on what the Fed is going to say about its economic projections and the plans to trim down its $4.2 trillion balance sheet. So we'll see where that takes us. Wall Street futures are a little bit higher right now, but mixed at the moment with a cautious but positive sentiment is really what we're seeing around the world. In the United States, one of the big stories today is going to be the bankruptcy filing of Toys R Us. It's the biggest toy retailer in the United States, and this will be the second largest ever retail bankruptcy filing, second only to Kmart back in 2002. Now, the company listed debts and assets of more than a billion each, but we're looking at an asset base of around $8 billion U.S. dollars, and the debt level is going to be significantly higher than the $1 billion threshold that the company needs to use when it's reporting to the court. Now, Again, this is simply another example of a bricks and mortar retailer which is falling foul of the online shopping rush and the ways in which consumer patterns and behaviors are changing with such kaleidoscopic speed. It really is quite an incredible story and one that is even more troubling when you consider the fact that the company did seem to be a lot more optimistic about the ways that it can draw customers into its stores. It really only expanded that big uh, central Manhattan store earlier this year. The company has been looking at different ways that it can use apps to find toys, toys within the store to attract younger clientele and therefore bring their parents with them and hopefully spend more money. But nonetheless, the ways in which it has tried to tinker with the business model have failed, at least at the moment. Now, we don't know what is going to happen to the 1,600 locations or probably more importantly the 60. 4,000 people that work for the company. It's too early days yet in order to make that assessment, and the company hasn't made any announcement. But the fact that it did seem to secure about $3 billion U.S. dollars in funding from a J.P. Morgan-led consortium of banks probably does mean that the people who are in charge of the company are pretty confident that it can maintain its status as much as we know it. The bankruptcy laws in the United States do allow for a bit of a breather from creditors in order for the company to try to steady the ship and exit with maybe a little bit better financial mechanics. I do think this is going to come out with a positive result though because of the commitment that the company that the company's owners have made to it but also the fact that it is heading into that key U.S. shopping season into November and obviously December. It would be a poor time to try and wrap up the operations whilst there is still so much money left on the table. If they can you know, maybe recalibrate the business proposition with a little bit more debt-friendly balance sheet, whilst at the same time attracting customers to an online strategy, you might have something. We don't know exactly what's going to happen yet, but we do seem to believe that considering the financing that's in place, this might not be the dramatic bankruptcy story that first appears. But nonetheless, it's just another example of the troubling times that the traditional retailers are having as the landscape changes amongst them almost on a daily basis. 
A story that's also changing on a daily basis and not for the good is Equifax. Their shares are called down about 2.2% in pre-market trading. That would indicate an opening price of around 92.25, and that would mean the company has lost more than one-third of its market value since the 7th of September when they told us about that data breach that affected 143 million customers of its credit providing service. It's an absolutely astonishing story. Biggest data breach in U.S. history, and it has reached the upper echelons of the United States government with respect to the troubling allegations and indeed the investigations that have followed. Now, the newest reports that we're seeing now come, first come from Bloomberg, but they have also been reported by the Washington Post that actually Equifax's first data breach happened in March of this year and not in July, as the company told us back on the 7th. Now, curiously, Equifax issued a statement that seemed to accept the March breach, although they haven't made that public as yet. That in and of itself is troubling enough for people to wonder whether or not this company has its hands around the situation. But furthermore, the fact that the data breach may have happened back in March also puts into focus the stock sales of senior executives within the company, some of which occurred in May and others which occurred on the first days of August. Now again, the company has been steadfast in its allegation that it didn't, that the executives who sold the shares did not know about the data breaches and therefore haven't run afoul of insider trading rules. That is being looked into at the moment, certainly by the Department of Justice, potentially by the Securities and Exchange Commission. But the fact that the company isn't disclosing a March breach that it does seem to accept took place puts that May stock sale certainly into sharper focus and definitely puts the August sales into focus because they were significant enough for investors to dump the stock at the time. If they were dumped on the basis of material insider information, that is a really significant problem. Now, there's a whole host of other problems within the company, of course, as a result of the breach and as a result of maybe looser regulations than are needed for these data providers, particularly when you consider the role that data plays in our everyday lives. So I do think this story has a lot of legs to go forward, and at the moment at least, it is very troubling to read some of these statistics and the timeline of the alleged hacks and, of course, the breach. The March breach doesn't appear to have lost any data, but the fact that uh, hackers seem to have been testing the vulnerability of the system seems to suggest that the company wasn't able to get its defenses in order for the breach that took place in July that, again, ultimately led to the loss of 143 million customers' data. Furthermore, it just raises once again the question as to why the company waited until the 7th of September to tell us about a breach that took place in July and hasn't told us yet about a breach that took place in March. Troubling questions indeed. Shares called about 2.3% lower, as I say, in pre-market trading. We're going to move on to a story with a little bit more good news, a little bit more fun, actually, and that is the development of shoe sales in the United States, particularly when it comes to athletic footwear. NPD, which is an analytics firm that looks at the trends that take place in consumer spending in the United States, has said that Adidas has actually vaulted over the Jordan brand and into second place in the athletic footwear rankings in terms of its sales based on what happened in the month of August. Adidas now has a 13% market share in the United States, still well below that of Nike, but nonetheless it is gaining ground, it seems, each and every month and each and every quarter, and it is the first time that it's vaulted over the Jordan brand, which is also under the Nike stable, it's one of the four, uh, Nike, Hurley, Converse, and Jordan, that are all within the athletic apparel company. But again, it's interesting, Nike is still the top dog, there's no question about it, but the fact that Adidas is in second place on Nike Nike's home turf is really quite an amazing development. It's interesting, too, in the fact that we are seeing basketball footwear sales fall significantly in the month of August, down about 40% by some estimations. And that has, of course, troubling implications for companies like Under Armour, which are making such a big deal out of their superstar signings, particularly with Steph, Stephon Curry with the uh, Golden State Warriors in California, and, of course, others and its association, it should be said, with the University of Maryland sports teams as well. But Adidas has been having some excellent success, it would seem, in signing the right superstars, James Harden and others, with the Houston Rockets, and also developing its market not only in the United States, but further afield, particularly in China, where it has a significant foothold in probably the fastest growing sportswear apparel market in the world, and it's far ahead of Nike in that respect. That's interesting, too, because 
Adidas has actually hit a record high earlier this year. Stocks have paired the gain a little bit, but on a year-to-date basis, Nike is up a little bit more than 5%. On a year-to-date basis, Adidas is up 31.5%, a little bit lower today. Maybe some profit-taking and maybe just investors a bit sanguine about the data points that they're seeing in the United States. But the way in which Adidas has challenged Nike's dominance in the last couple of years is really quite extraordinary, largely again, and reflecting back to the Toys R Us story, on the basis of its online platform. And that's something that the company intends to continue to expand in the months and years ahead. Nike is trying to play catch up, is trying to get associations with Amazon and others in order to move its gear more quickly and more efficiently. But it has lost ground. And on the basis of these numbers from MPD, it continues to lose ground to its chief rival. We're going to watch that with interest going in to the peak Christmas period. But Adidas stealing a march, no question about it. And jumping over the jump man, the Jordan brand, for the first time in 30 years. Wall Street, as I say, called a little bit higher as I speak. We are looking at about a 25-point gain for the Dow Jones Industrial Average at the start of trading today. We'll probably get a little bit softer gains for the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, according to what I'm seeing in U.S. futures prices. But nonetheless, we probably will extend the all-time highs that we're seeing, both on the big board and indeed on the Dow as well. Fifth consecutive high yesterday, it turns out, for the Dow as a result of the uh, investor optimism. Maybe some slightly higher crude prices are part of the reason, too. Now, I did mention the U.S. dollar and the Federal Reserve, of course, that is going to be key for market developments in the coming days. We won't get anything today, but the anticipation is that tomorrow interest rates are going to stay unchanged, but the anticipation is that the Fed will probably make its final hike of the year at its December meeting. There's a 55.3% chance, based on futures prices at the moment, that that's exactly what's going to happen. What we're going to wait for, of course, is clues as to when, how, and how quickly the Fed is going to unwind that $4.2 trillion balance sheet. That will lift U.S. bond yields and, of course, will have implications for consumer borrowing costs in the months ahead, but we don't know exactly where it's headed. A lot will be based on the forward projections for the U.S. economy that Jenny Yellen explains at her press conference tomorrow. But as I say, Wall Street looking relatively good right now. Europe looking mixed. Dollar a little bit weaker, but it's all to play for tomorrow, and we'll watch that with interest. That's it from us and Five Before the Bell in Central London. I'm Martin Bakadax, London Bureau Chief at TheStreet.com. Thanks for watching. We'll see you guys tomorrow.